Well, we're not in the middle of nowhere. Here we are. <laughs> but it isn't far from here. <laughs> it's right, right there. <laughs> Actually, we're currently in southeastern Montana, kind of heading for North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa maybe. This is a different kind of trip for Gone Again. It's not going to be boondocking, and it's not going to be exploring the desert. This is going to be something different. I'm going to bring you guys along. We've done this before, but it's been quite a while, maybe even before we started making YouTube videos. I think so. And we didn't know what we were doing then. And we don't know what we're doing now. So that didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> it's different, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be fun. Yeah. Well, this was once the bustling town of Ingemar. Back in the early 1900s, it was a, a place where they raised sheep, a lot of sheep. And there was a lot of business going on here, and a lot of people lived here. Of course, back in that day, the train would have stopped here. There was schools, or a school, churches. Um, you know, you get the regular store. Uh, they tell the story here on this store behind me that Things were so busy here that one time the train stopped and they were offloading goods and before they got the goods to the store, everything was sold. Well, I'm standing in front of the Jersey Lily, which has been in business here continuously since the early 1900s. And it was named after a an actress, a vaudeville star, I believe, and the man was so uh, infatuated with her, the owner of this business, that he named it after her in hopes that she would come and visit someday. I don't know that she ever did, but interesting story. It's for sale. You can buy it right now for $225,000. But you know, even though it looks like nothing's here, there are a lot of farmers in the area here and they probably depend on this place because it's open for business. Well, I don't know if you can tell by looking at the scenery behind me, but the smoke is really thick here from the forest fires in other parts of Montana. And Linda and I are going to continue southeastward and see if we can get out of the smoke. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon and we're going to start looking for a place to camp too. Well, we've been driving all day, left home this morning, uh, mid-morning, and uh, just kind of kept at it because we wanted to get out of the heavier smoking smoke areas. And it's starting to let up a little bit here, not, not as bad as it's been. It's still, you know, that yellow light, that orange light when the sun comes through the smoke. Well, we're, we've still got that. We're on BLM land. It's uh, Strawberry Hill is the name of this area, Highway 12, east of Mile City. Uh, there's just a couple places to camp. You need a kind of high ground clearance to get in here. This sure is beautiful though. This is a very nice place. It's going to be quiet. We're far enough off the freeway that, or the highway that we're not going to get any noise here. So we ended up in a good spot. Time for a beer. Got here late yesterday afternoon. That's the first vehicle that's gone by on this dirt road. Last night was so quiet and peaceful. You know, it was really busy, of course, the week up until before we left, and especially the day before we left. There was <clears throat> so many last minute projects that I had forgotten to do. You start loading the car and you go, car in the trailer, and you go, oh shoot, you know? And so I was up to like midnight the night, you know, night before last. But last night, man, did I sleep. I went to bed just after, just when it started to get dark. What was that, nine o'clock or something? Woke up at uh, almost eight o'clock this morning. I slept so sound, I must have really needed it. You know, I was thinking about uh, one of my favorite YouTubers. Um, in her last video, she was suffering stress. She, I think, uh, I don't know why, but she was uh, suffering from depression. 
mostly and um, various reasons you know that she was trying to describe but sometimes you don't know exactly what it is that's got you down you know but she went she'd been sitting in the same spot for about three weeks had been sitting there for a long time and was by herself and but she went for a walk and she went for a walk in the woods and she all of a sudden started feeling better started thinking about things and started figuring it out whatever it was um I, my heart went out to her I, I i really felt sorry for her but that walk in the woods i discovered way back uh i used to go hunting like in hawaii you can hunt just about year round for one thing or another and i used to go hunting like once a week and it wasn't really hunting to get anything i just enjoyed the being out there so much back then my kids were still home and they were young and i had a lot of uh a lot of stress myself but as soon as i would get out and and start moving and uh through the uh, hunting areas up there I'd start figuring things out and I'd be walking along and I'd be praying and and just just when you're walking the blood is moving through your bloodstream you got more blood and more oxygen to your brain and that really helps your brain can put everything into its into perspective and put all the cogs into place and everything and it just works just to get your blood flowing the other thing is too um, when I get out like that and walking in the woods or walking in the desert you know you're not thinking about anything else except for you're just totally in the minute what's over the next hill what's down that valley and you're not thinking about anything that's going on at home so there's that too it's sometimes you can't get out for a, a week long road trip or an extended trip. You don't have to, if you can just get out for an afternoon by yourself, uh, it really helps. And it really helped her. And I could just, I could just see it happening as she was doing it. And it just helps to get out where you don't have anything, anything pressing on you, any problems, uh, just you know just walking along and thinking well one thing today is it's going to be hot it's supposed to be hit 100 degrees here in southeast montana but we're moving a little further east and i'll see i'll see where we get to today we're going to see what kind of fun stuff we can find along the way because as you know we always take the road less traveled so we might find some things that you know you don't normally see on youtube well i hope so anyway we'll find out we're not lost, but we are temporarily confused at the moment. We're in the National Grasslands area of North Dakota. It's on the south end of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And it's a lot of wide open spaces. Now I'm sure in the early spring, this is probably all lush and green. The thing about National Grasslands or National Grasslands areas is they try to keep the grass as original as it was uh, back before white man came along. So it shouldn't be um, interspersed with um, alien species and things like that. It is a true look at what this area looked like uh, in the early days. Now with corn on one side and grassland on the other side, we're looking for a place called Fort Dilts. That's with a D, D-I-L-T-S out here on this single lane dirt road. So Fort Dilts was built in this area in 1864 in response to Indian attacks on wagon trains in this area. One of the, from the very first battle, the, from what I just read, it was Sioux Indians, and uh, they, of course, were responding to previous attacks on their villages, but they, would, they attacked innocent wagon trains coming through here. And one of the attacking warriors at that time was a young sitting bull right here in this area. 
So these grave markers were put here to honor soldiers that were killed in the that early battle here in 18, 1864. Now we were just traveling these back roads out here and it was getting pretty boring to tell you the truth, driving across the grasslands, but you never know what you're gonna encounter out here. And we didn't expect to find this fort. This was just happen chance. The fort's long gone, of course, but just the location is here with the history. One little piece of, in, of history that's true, but it's, it's a shame to have to mention it is after the attack on that innocent wagon train, which was accompanied by some soldiers. Uh, the people of that wagon train left behind a box of bread that was laced with strychnine. The Indians came across it and they hungrily ate it, killing many of them. And that fact was hidden for more than a hundred years from our history. But now it's, you read it on the reader boards here at Fort Diltz. Out here, there was an Indian encampment of 1,400 lodges. That's a lot of Indians. They attacked a wagon train and killed 30 to 50 settlers. Things were rough back in those days. You can see in this drawing here, that they built a uh, escarpment out of our breastwork out of prairie sod to help protect them while they waited for reinforcements to come. And it says that uh, a number of civilians and eight of the 50 members of the Cal Calgary detachment were killed at this location here. You can pause it here if you want to read this. Unfortunately, most of these reader boards are not legible. There's more of these grave markers here. I, I think they must be in honor of the eight uh, soldiers that died defending this wagon train here. It's gonna be hard for you to see, maybe impossible, but what we're looking at here is the remains of the sod wall that went around this big wagon train that was located here. That's the way I understand it anyway. How would you like to have been a soldier stationed out here for months on end? No women, no booze. <laughs> no, seriously. How would you like to have been stationed out here on the prairie? Linda's going back to the car. Um, she senses things that, that I don't and she got a real strange feeling down through here and. She says she just feel better. She went back to the car. I'm gonna finish the tour down through here. This is a big pit in the ground here. It looks like it was maybe 20 feet across. It could have been a defensive rifle pit dug hastily. I mean, a wagon train against couple thousand Indians? Whoa. Well, 1,400 lodges. So maybe a thousand Indians anyway. Warriors? How many warriors? I don't know. Doesn't say. It says that the soldiers were using 12 pounders, mountain howitzers. 12 pound is the uh, weight of the charge that it, or the projectile that it fired. It said that they would run those ahead of the wagon train and put, put them on a high spot uh, just to kind of clear the area out in front or protect the wagon train as it went by. And then they would ride out front again. Uh, they said that during this attack, this, the howitzers were set up to um, pour fire down into the draws. And also to the south of us was a hill and the Indians were attacking from this hill. Beyond the hill here, you can see the uh, the wind generators there, but between us and the wind generators is that hill. Turning back here now to showing to the north, opposite the hill, you can see this is the where the wagon train was here. 
This says Strategic Hilltop. And I guess that the uh, army was able to charge and capture that hilltop because the uh, Indians were raining fire down into this wagon train encampment here down below. It's not a very high hill, just high enough to give them uh, covering or cover for their fire. Because all of these are gone, or so many of them, we can just read a few words here and there. I'll try to look up Fort Diltz for you and put a link in the description to any information I find down below and you can read it for yourself. That's one thing about traveling out through the Midwest areas. We're just on the edge of the Midwest, on the western edge. <laughs> but uh, you just find things out in the middle of nowhere that you don't expect to come across. Hopefully I'll be able to show you some more of those oddities in future videos. So as I've been walking in kind of a circle, this is the remains of that sod a wall. Of course, that would have been maybe six feet high, or I don't know how high, but something they could hide behind and shoot. It might not have been that high, but this is the remains of that sod berm. And you can see where they dug the sod out from on the other side. It's kind of like a ditch here on the other side. And then this high spot here. Boy, that was a lot of work. But they were wide open here. On the car is a large reader board with the, some of the history of that wagon train. And it's, it's who led it, where they got their permission to travel through here from, what route they, they were told to, they couldn't go just willy nilly any route they wanted to go. They had to follow certain routes. And it's all about who was on the wagon train and who attacked it and uh, where they were headed how many people, uh, but rather than uh, read all that to you, like I say, I'll put it in the description down below the video. Now it's time for us to go look for civilization ourselves.